you know, we have these different initiatives happening in the Fargo-Moorhead area where we want to make sure that we are protecting one another and that everybody is safe and that we prevent further tragedies from happening. And so the Indigenous Community Circle is kind of all-encompassing uh, independent entity that wanted to help focus on different areas. And so one of the areas also was um, food and nutrition and fitness uh, and the youth. And so it kind of morphed into the um, Indigenous food ecology and uh, what was the other one on that? It's kind of a different youth food and ecology. Youth, food and ecology. Yeah, so like we're always forever evolving, but i um, just thankful to have good-hearted people like Rick um, that, you know, will continue to uh, stand with us and, and we it's a mutual uh, respect and understanding that we have within the community and definitely a great great model I would say for others to replicate and so so at the Indigenous Association we have uh, we had a, a traditional ecological knowledge um, series where we had youth come in and learn about different things around like um, food medicine plants um, and you'll see some of the things that actually came from that that uh, that series, and for one of those those um, projects that we did, we had the youth come out, and they um, ended up going out to the the Gladys Ray Garden, and um, Rick picked all kinds of different beautiful flowers and plants, um, and we used that pigmentation um, for that one right there, the um, see the one with the cloth. Um, all those colors are from plants, and so what um, we did is we visited the garden. Rick told us um, he he he's really like. Um, He's not um, Native American, but he's worked with a lot of different communities, and he knows a lot of, about um, a lot of things. Um, and so he was telling us about a little bit about the, the names, and like I think he knew the names in Ojibwe of some of these, the scientific names, the like the uses for these different plants, like the, just really taught these uh, kids just and me, like I didn't know this stuff either. Um, and he taught me and the adults that were helping out about all these things. And then so we ended up having a big, uh, like a whole table full of plants, as you can see there, on the, uh, up there. And we took these plants and we uh, had someone come in and um, they were giving us words in Ojibwe. Um, and then we, we kind of did the outline of the, the, the plant or the design that we did. Um, we used Ojibwe words to kind of circle or encircle that, that um, Flowers. Some people made flowers. Some people made designs. Some people made like bears. It was really cool. And then we used little teeny hammers, and we um, used the plants to kind of um, knock the pigment out of them and, and help uh, color the the um, handkerchief. And through that, it was it was so cool because through that one project, the youth got outside. The youth learned more about the the world around them, the the plants, the um, the garden. They they. None of them knew that that garden existed. They didn't know that was a, like something that they could access, and um, they learned a little bit more about a lot of folks from Ojibwe, and so they learned more about their language. And if it wasn't their language, they learned about another language, which maybe could help spark some interest in um, wherever um, they're from to kind of go back and learn some of that. And so, to me, it was it was a really powerful, like really dynamic um, project uh, that we did with you know the help of Rick and having the garden there as a resource for our community. Um, and you, you see a couple other projects there. If you get a chance to, um, just a plug for Dana Tricky over there with her quill work um, stuff. She's actually the one that helped us um, do those quill work, work pieces. That was part of that same series. Um, and you know, she taught us how to use um, quills and how to dye quills and like how to put it on birch bark and all that stuff. So um, I feel like, I'm going to step on a soapbox real quick. Um, I feel like we're as a society, we're getting less and less connected and more and, more, and less and less outdoors. And so like part of what I really want to do with the Indigenous Association and how we're connected to this project, the Multicultural Youth, uh, Food, Youth, and Ecology Project, is getting youth connected to the community, getting them connected to like where does your food come from, um, what is like traditional medicine, like how can we use this, how did our grandmothers and, and grandfathers and um, relatives and our ancestors use these things that were around us all the time to make our lives better and to help people around us. And so we do a lot of um, talking about like how how can we really uh, 
integrate some of these things in our life and understand some of these ways that we're connected to the water, to the earth, to the to all this, um, to really make an impact in the way they see the world. So, you know, if you know where things are coming from and you know what scarcity is and you know what natural medicine is, like you're more likely to respect it and really try to seek that out and conserve and be mindful of what you're doing as a, as a person, as an individual and as a community. And so hopefully through this, this partnership with the Food, Youth, and Ecology Project at RIC, um, we will give youth the opportunity to um, learn that and also maybe get them interested in being, like create pathways into like agriculture or other um, fields that are connected to like the earth and the plants and the food and all that because I think sometimes our kids like they're looking for a direction um, and through these programs we can help connect them to their culture and maybe even help them find pathways to the future um, yeah I know when I was a kid I grew up in the Twin Cities um, my family's from White Earth uh, and I grew up in the Twin Cities, and I wasn't very connected to my culture. And it, it always felt like something that was, I, was, I lost. My grandma died, you know, from cirrhosis when I was really young. Like, I remember her um, when I was really young, like four. Like, I couldn't say thank you. I had to say miigwech, right? Like, that was my grandma. She, she made sure that she was instilling some of that stuff into me. Um, and then I lost that. And I didn't have anyone else I was connected to that was teaching those things to me. And so as I was growing up, you know, I got into trouble. I got, you know, I did my, you know, I was a, kind of a crazy teenager, like a lot of us are. Um, but when I, I got older and I started working with youth and I, you know, went to school and got a degree in social work and I wanted to help people. But one thing that I always thought was missing was that connection to culture. And like, if we can connect people to culture, connect people to food, connect them to productive things, give them pathways to see a, a, a future that they want to be a part of um, and not necessarily just say that, well, your dad was this, or your grandma was this, or, you know, and a lot of times in a negative context, like your your dad was an alcoholic, so you're going to be an alcoholic. Your mom was a drug addict, you're going to be a drug addict. Like, like no, like that, that happened. That's true. That's not the only thing they were, by the way. And also, like, you don't have to go down that path, too. Like, there's, there's some options for you to kind of... Um, to do something else and we believe in you and here are some ways that you could do that. It's attainable. Like you don't need to worry about like, like, um, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to think that you can't do these things because we believe in you and we're adults in your life and we really care about you and we'll help you figure out those pathways. Um, so I, I used to get really excited about this because I think, I think, um, I know the youth are our future and, um, youth are really dynamic and smart. And if you give them the opportunity to, to really like dig into a problem and be part of the solution, they'll take it. And they'll come up in, and they'll do that in ways that you don't really think because maybe you have a certain idea of how things are gonna go. Um, but like sometimes they just think outside of the box and they know kind of what's going on in different ways. So I think having youth and adults work together on problems um, and look toward pathways for the future, I think we, we have a dynamic world and if we overlook that um, and we overlook the youth perspective and we overlook the, the ability for youth to be active contributors to the good in our world, um, then we miss out on something very, very dynamic and very great. So I get really excited about that and so I'm always excited to work with Rick. I, I, was, I heard about him like, I've been working in the Fargo-Moorhead community for like four or five years and since I came into this community, I was like, oh, you should meet Rick, you should meet Rick, you should meet Rick. Um, and finally, a couple of years ago, I did meet Rick, and I was like, yeah, I, I probably should have met him earlier. Um, so he's working really hard to help make those things happen in the indigenous community, um, also in new American community. Um, and uh, the, there's a church also that has a pollinator garden that's getting rid of some, some parking lot to build like a, a larger pollinator garden in Moorhead. Um, there's just all kinds of things that he's connected to to help make our community a better place. We wanted to you know, make sure that we amplify and uplift our youth um, because this past summer Maya took more of a leadership role with the garden um, in finding a day of the week that worked for different individuals to come and it's so hard with scheduling, you know, but um, she was able to keep leading the way and we showed up as her family to support her, um, but, you know, just continuing to, to show up rain or shine, even, you know, working into uh, the night, some nights, you know, if we knew the following day was going to be really, really warm weather. 
Um, and so she, she kept the torch going for the garden and um, really learned a lot from Rick. And so we're really thankful for her to have this experience sort of in an urban area, you know, not, not being on home, back home on the res where we're from. Because um, growing up, you know, as she mentioned, my mom had a huge garden and I grew up with that experience as a, a kid. And all of our surplus produce we always gave away to the community, you know, first to the elders and then to the community members. And we'd go, you know, door to door um, and knock on the door. And, um, you know, we would ride along in, in the, the trunk of my mom's old car. That was this big, long, steel type of a car, you know, but the, the trunks were very deep. So we had all of the produce bagged up in brown bags. And um, that was kind of my first door knocking experience. But it just um, really built or instilled in us a sense of community to make sure that we look out for one another. So I feel like that's kind of a common theme throughout the garden experience and the, the healing garden, even though we're in a, a urban setting such as Fargo, um, it really provides a, a sense of um, belonging. My experience with the garden has been really good. I like working at the garden. My grandma used to have a garden when I was younger, and she would do fruits and vegetables every summer. And I kind of just started helping her with that, and it kind of became an ongoing thing. And I really enjoyed it. And so I was excited when Rick asked me to come help with the garden more, because we were helping making new friends. Yeah. This is all of us at the garden. Um, and th we ended up planting, we had to use some of these big pots and we ended up planting um, like sage and sweetgrass in the big pots so that it didn't spread all over um, in the other parts of the garden in our fruit spots. Um, we ha we've had a few um, trials, I guess you could say learning experiences um, one uh, was we we're in a city space so the space that we were in was there was a house used to be there and so it was removed and so the space was just sitting there and that's when like ICC was like well look at this space because we're, we're looking around like where do we put community gardens around in Fargo and then that's when that space was kind of um, you know uh, a space that we were talking about but one of, the, one of the things that we went through was at one area, it was um, not level, so it would get flooded. And so we, um, we had to bring, you know, in more soil and, um, and, you know, fill that area. But when we, were, when we were filling it and digging, we realized that about like six feet under or maybe there was um, a sidewalk. So then we ended up having to dig all that up to get out that sidewalk because then because it, we wouldn't get the roots growing under there if we didn't remove that so then that was another um trial and then um we get a lot of uh resident help and then COVID hit and the shelter was moved from where it was to downtown so then we didn't have any of the resident help every day that we were getting and it was COVID, and then it was a drought. So I don't know if you guys remember that. So we had a drought too. And so then, um, and we had just planted the orchard trees. And so it, you had to water them for like five minutes each. And so it, we, just, we just had some, some trials. And then it, it would be usually one of us because we didn't want to bring a whole bunch of people out there because it was COVID. Even though we were outside, you know, we, there, you just didn't know all the, all, all the you know, how easy it was to transmit or transfer. So um, we wanted to be safe too. So it would be a lot of us, you know, spending a couple hours out there on a day. But, um, um, and so that's the no mold because we ended up having the city mode one day when, um, and so the, um, the kids made the no mold signs and they're just adorable. There's probably a couple more of those in here. Um, so we'll just kind of go through some of these and if, um, and so in our first year, because it takes a couple of years to get apples, we got apples last year, but we got two. <laughs> so we were like really proud of those two apples. <laughs> and these, our, our, our beds were made out of um, cedar. So they tried to be as, um, 
you know, as traditional to everything that we could with what resources that we had. Um, and this is another family that comes out to the garden. Um, and so we added this other, this other bed we added last year too. Um, and we're trying to get one on the other side so we can have more space for food. And then this was before we put, we did a three sisters in the middle, like where that lawn chair is. We ended up, or is that a lawn chair? I can't see very well, fuck it. <laughs> but we ended up, um, and I, we can talk more about that when we get up there, but um, these are just some of the slides. This is Ruth and, and Maya. And watering. And so you see in the back there, that is, um, that is um, more like prairie. And then over here, there's also a, a pollinator garden. And we saw, um, there was like, we had like tons of bees, like butterflies and everything, it was beautiful. And you can kind of see like the shape of the, the raised beds. Um, we had a really cool shot of it. It looks almost as though like a, a star, you know, from a star quilt, mm -hmm. uh, which was intentional, but it's beautiful to see when you actually take a step back. Mm -hmm. But there's more of, and then this past summer too, Nick, uh, Nick, sorry, Rick would have um, educational sessions even with the, with the youth, you know, they do some planting and then they would end the session with some educational like programming and, and things so a lot of knowledge sharing was was happening and it was really rich and really amazing to see this is one of the twins uh, watering they were active participants in you know watering the garden of course we're aware of like child labor laws so <laughs> no worries there no. <laughs> and this is um, this is a uh, this is me and Rick, and we go over and we get from Toby at uh, Legendary Gardens. She plants, her and her husband plant from their home, and um, we, um, they, they donate plants to us every year. And Rick gives out plants to, like, every single person. His whole yard is filled, and then, like, people just come and grab them. So that she's, she's, her and her husband are wonderful. And this just appeared there, so sometimes that happens too, where people will just put something in the garden and we don't know where it came from, but it's just like a beautiful little <laughs> gift. <laughs> and this is another family that comes and we, we ended up blocking out these so it'd be easier when the um, when we have all the kids out to plant, if they know, like, go in this square, this square. My apple and grass. <laughs> Having fun. <laughs> This is my mama and Rick, and this, oh, and then this is our, we, um, so then this is, so you saw the back of the garden, now we put in the front of the garden, this is the sidewalk runs right here, and Gladys Ray Shelter is right next to us, and this is, um, we, um, did a medicine wheel, can you get, so you see it? And so in, by design, each of those little quadrants um, were a, a specific color and plant, you know, like similar to our traditional medicine wheel with um, white, yellow, black, and red. And so we tried to improvise the best we could with the different traditional plants and to, to match the colors of each of the different quadrants, including sage and cedar and, and sweet grass even. More families in the garden. Spider. There's no more of our no more signs. It was cute to see the NOMO, uh, the action taken because, you know, as, she meant, as Amanda mentioned, it's city land, but the city uh, kept m plowing or mowing our traditional um, plants or, you know, and so they kept, they thought they were, the city thought they were doing a good thing by mowing the grass for us, but we're like, no, those are, you know, we want them, no, no. And so the youth even got involved and were making these little NOMO signs, you know, so it was kind of turned a, pos a negative into a positive. This is another photo from uh, partnerships within the Fargo-Moorhead metro area where there's so many different community gardens in the Fargo-Moorhead area. And so Rick ha built this partnership, the network, to uh, partner with other community gardens and to have activities with the youth, uh, which was really fun to see and, and to very inspiring just to see other uh, community garden networks connect. Um, this was an event me and Rick went to. I 
can't remember what it was for, but MSUM, it was at MSUM, and we just, it's an event where we go to places and we talk about the garden, and yeah, a lot of people came over, we talked about it, what we do, and it was a fun experience, uh, yeah. Is there a certain amount of yield that you're trying to get to for the community? And, and I guess, <clears throat> how did you, uh, as a young person, um, get interested in it? So that uh, if I was to go back to my community and say, hey, we want all these young people to be a part of this, most of our people are like, I want to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you volunteering? Um, I, I just love nature and planting plants and it's just a fun experience because you're doing it with family and friends. So, so that middle area is um, this past summer we broke up broke the ground up there um, to plant three sisters you know corn beans and squash um, and it was a process to because it was grass you know we had to go through and use the old style method of breaking up the soil and um, planting. Another um, little bit of a problem that happened is we got to the garden and I'm like, oh, a tree fell yeah. right on our stuff. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, he just worked through it. Yeah. <laughs> like Rick, it, literally a tree just <laughs> smashed the berries. <laughs> but the gnome didn't get smashed. Yeah. He just <laughs> sit there and he's like, thank God. <laughs> You can see that middle area too wasn't broken up yet with soil. I mean, you know, how we were able to plant the three sisters in the middle. Yeah, the trees really came a long way from the from start to finish. You know, it was pretty cool to see um, the trees, be, you know, be strong and vibrant to where they are today. It was a process. For sure. But I'm sure we're preaching to the choir. <laughs> the, the question I got kind of goes back to what you kind of first introduced as the idea of like of the youth. Okay, so we have um, this idea of the youth uh, being equal into this um, to this whole idea of, of the American dream, right? And so we're always asking our youth to be um, going to these higher standards uh, of what it should be outside of our communities. And then um, then they don't perform to those levels. And I think you're kind of getting to the edge of it where you were saying that there's always this discrepancy of why are they in these jails and then why are they kind of sidelined in the schools and, and this industrialization is not really performing to the level that we think that our kind of people should go to at these levels, right? And so the American dream isn't there. And so um, what is it that uh, we should be working towards, I guess, in terms of our youth? Because I think as a person who went through, you know, school and whatnot, I'm looking back and I'm going, like, should I have spent my time more within the, the context of... Uh, of a living organism uh, of our community rather than trying to always go get the car, go get the apartment, go get the whatchamacallit, go get the all of these ideals outside of our community. And what is it that we need to kind of focus on with them regards that? Because it seems like if I was to, you know, be the non-native educator, I'd be going, like, oh my gosh, all of our kids are challenged in one way or another could be labeled disabled? Is our whole community disabled in some sort of way? Does that grant us extra dollars to, to apply for these different things? Or is it just a different intelligence that we need to exercise in terms of uh, what's local to our communities? So we're not putting these stresses on that we need to meet, you know, the, the um, what do you call it, the, the commodification process or the assimilation process to be able to handle what's going on. And, and I was just wondering if DAPL kind of helped with that within those locations. I'm, I'm sorry, just yeah. crazy talk right now. Oh. Sorry. Oh. No, I guess I just wondered in, in those areas, is the, are the youth, are 
you still expecting them to be in the schools and then learning all of these non-native things that are the ideals and then come back to home and go like, oh, did you get your thermos from Walmart so that you can do these things? Mm -hmm. And then is the participation of the youth, are they actually making their own community? So that those are lifelong kind of things like, yo, bro, what's happening, man, you know? Um, I have some thoughts about that, and I think that it comes back to like when we're working in the traditional ecological knowledge piece with the youth, it's like bringing the elders in and like really having them teach about like the the stories, the history, the the real history, right? The real history and the real stories that you know a lot of times our youth don't get in schools or they don't necessarily have access to, um, and letting that guide where they want to go. Let the elders come in and let them be connected and let them give them opportunity to teach the youth and then let the youth say, we've heard all these stories and we know all these things and we know this about about our, our world here, like, because um, my my um, grandma told me, but I also know about this and they're living in two worlds and they can use that knowledge from both worlds maybe to make the world a better place, but getting like informed through some of the traditional knowledge holders and the things in the stories and the, the practices of our elders. Like, I feel like I missed out a lot of that when I was younger. And I, I like, as whenever I have the opportunity, I try to take that in because I, I miss that piece. And if we can get opportunities for youth to get that, that sort of knowledge and that sort of mentoring and uh, I don't, attention or, or, you know, things, and then give them the, the microphone, I guess. Like, I'm really about, like, getting youth to, like, be direct what's happening instead of it being from the top down. But, uh, like, once they have that, wow, once they have that, <laughs> once they have that knowledge and that information and they have that guidance, yes, <laughs> and then they get excited, you know, <laughs> And, yeah, and then letting youth direct kind of the, the adults around them. Like yeah. I really think that's important, and yeah. you know, and having those those elders around all the time to really give that feedback and like say like, oh yeah, you're doing good, my boy. You know, like yeah. like they, we need that. Yeah, I mean, I can add like I think being in an urban setting, um, there are a lot of interesting factions to staying true to your values and who you are. Um, and coming from matriarchal, matrilineal people, and then learning to develop trust with a non-native person, you know. Um, so where we are with Rick today is beautiful, but you know, it, it took some time, it took some effort, it took some uncomfortable conversations to be had mm -hmm. on being a a strong native woman, you know, who comes from a matriarchal, matrilineal peoples where um, you don't back down, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, just sharing like that, we had, to, we had to have compromise, but because oftentimes, no offense, but I think the patriarchy is different in different groups of people. Um, older white men, you know, if even I'm, I'm a former state legislator from North Dakota where the majority is older white men. And there there are still the, the, the mindset, there there is still that mindset of, women are less, and especially Native women are even lesser than white women. So not to kind of go off in a different tangent, but you know, when we talk about the American dream, yeah, it would be great if everybody had equal access to the American dream. But I think what I'm hearing is that definitely what I agree with is that Native youth should have their voice front and center of these efforts um, because they know what's best and they, they, not to put pressure on them, but they are going to be leading us. You know, they are, um, they are right now already leading us and their voice is important. Um, not everybody has to do the cookie cutter, you know, path of high school, college, or, you know, like she's, a, she's an artist and loves to draw. Um, and, and then we have other children who are, you know, science and math, you know, so I don't think we can, you know, judge everybody um, the same or in one, one particular box or category. I don't know if I'm helping answer your question, but um, that's just my perspective, um, that it is really important to be grounded in who you are, first and foremost, um, because if you have a strong sense of self, that in of itself is a protective factor. 
Um, I spent some time in Minneapolis when I was a young adult, single with no dependents, and actually tutored and uh, mentored Native youth in Minneapolis at the Division of Indian Work, and it was an eye-opener. You know, you get to see the files of kids' registration forms and see, you know, their tribal affiliation, and I would always be excited to see some from MHA. Hey, you're from MHA, but they had no connection, you know, no connection at all which was amazing for me to see um, back in like 1998, 99, you know, and so I know that there are great strides being made for people to connect to who they are, no matter if it's later in life or early in life, but we know it is a protective factor across the board, whether you're native or non-native, to have a strong sense of self, so. Thank you. I think we've gone over our time, so I'm not sure that we'll be able to finish all of Rick's slides here. Um, <laughs> so, but I just want to say thank you for coming to our presentation and hope that we have helped in some way and if anybody else wants to add closing thoughts or words. All right, Mods, thank you. Thank you.